Good morning. Come on and stand together and worship together this morning.
ahead and have a seat for just a minute. What what a word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, we I, I believe you all know what that word means. It means praise ye the Lord. And uh, it's given to us in the imperative. It means it's a command. You praise the Lord. Praise you the Lord. What, what, a, what an opportunity we get to do that. And we can sing songs just like that. We, we raise a hallelujah. We raise our praises to the Lord because he is worthy. What, what an opportunity we get to just love on Jesus and celebrate him today. And uh, we do welcome you. Thank you for being here with us this morning. If you are our guest, we offer a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us this morning. And, and everybody, there should be a, a, a communication card there in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you're new to us, fill that out. We would love to have a record of your attendance and know how to get in touch with you. And as always, home folks, if um, anything has changed with your information, we'd love to have an update on your information. If you just want to communicate anything to us, do that. And on the back of that, of course, for everyone, if there's any kind of prayer request that you may have that you want your pastors to know about, or we can be praying with you specifically about the things going on in your life and in your family and what might be, be coming in your future, decisions, choices, uh, uh, struggles, whatever it may be, we would love to be able to pray with you specifically over those things. If you would allow us to do that, we, we would be honored. And know that uh, unless you tell us to, we will keep it in confidence. We won't be blabbing your business around with everybody else. We, but we do want to know how we can pray with you intentionally and, and purposefully. So uh, if you would allow us to do that, we'd love to. Uh, also, the, we were still not passing around the offer plates. I'm not sure when we're going to get back to doing that. But for now, uh, you can drop any tithes or offerings you have there. Bruce is back there pointing to the plates right now at the back door. You can drop them there or you can put them in the slot in the wall and outside the foyer. Or you can give online. You can log into our website and there's a little icon there and you can click there. You can give online however you want to give. But uh, please be faithful in your giving because the ministry of our Lord continues. And, and next Sunday morning, we're going to share a little bit about that as we uh, enter into a, an intentional day of prayer all day long. In the morning, we're going to have a, a, a day of prayer for the persecuted church. And then uh, next Sunday night, we're going to have a time of prayer for our nation as we are entering uh, the week of the election, just to, just to ask God's blessing and, and his covering. And, and just, just next week, it's going to be all about prayer. And, uh, you know, we, we mentioned the persecuted church often around here because it's a very real thing. Uh, we have brothers and sisters around the world who just for naming Christ as Savior, their very lives are on the line. And uh, through your tithes and offerings, we help support those people. We, we, we get supplies to them and, and, and uh, get Bibles in their hands through organizations that we partner with. So uh, it's important. It's more than just having this building with our padded pews and air conditioning, which we all enjoy, right? I'm a, I'm a fat guy who's hot natured anyway. I love this air conditioning. Uh, but it's more than that. It's about the sake of the gospel. It's about sharing his love, about sharing his message. And the reality is the world we live in, nothing's free. And uh, so your, your, your tithes and your offerings, they help to fund these things so we can make this gospel known to the nations. That's what the church is about, right? That was what our Lord told us to do, to go into all the world and preach this gospel to the whole of creation. So let's be busy about that. Uh, no, uh, we're going to... We're going to continue to worship through song here in just a minute. And then when we get through with that, Pastor Mark's going to stand and he's going to open the word of God. And I'm excited to hear what he's got to share with us from God's word today. And so let's, let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. And uh, let's prepare our hearts for what God has before us. Lord, uh, we are, as always, Lord, we are amazed in your presence. And God, we, we come to you today in your house and we come before your table where you have spread a banquet before us through your word. So God, I pray that as, as the meal is served from, from your pulpit today, Lord, that we would eat heartily, not, not just sip on the milk, but Lord, we would chew on the fat, on the meat of God's word, that it would nurture us and grow us into the people of God that you would have us be. Change our hearts, oh God. Mold us into the image of Christ. Make us more and more like him. And God, as we sing these next few songs leading up to that, Lord, I pray that you would just listen in and the praises of your people would just resound through the courts of your kingdom. Bring a smile to your face that even the angels would listen in as those who are redeemed by grace sing of the goodness of our God. 
So Lord, just be magnified in everything we do in this place. Let it bring glory to your great name. And Lord, truly, in our lives, in our actions, in everything we do, God, may we raise a hallelujah. May we bring praise to our God. And we thank you for this day you've given us and for the opportunity to freely gather in your house. Let us not take it for granted. And help us to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who, who aren't afforded this. God, to encourage them, to lift them up, to help them in any way we can. And Lord, show us what it is we can do to be part of the ministry, to minister to our brothers and sisters around the world. God, you truly are good. You're loving, you're kind. And it's our joy to serve you. It's our joy to worship you. So receive the praises of your people today as we sing, we worship, we fellowship in your name, and we open your word. God, have your way, and we'll thank you. We love you, our good God. We love you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
See you. 
That was extra dramatic. A little anticipation, right? Man, what a good worship set. Thank you uh, so much. I was so thankful this morning for the preparation that was put into uh, us being able to worship corporately together this morning. And I was, as I was enjoying singing with my church, I was thinking about how much time goes on in the background for our musicians and our singers and what they invest to make sure that they can bring us together in corporate worship on a Sunday morning, and then I think of uh, what goes into our side of it to bring together, to come in and corporate, corporately worship together, and uh, we, we've got to be doing our part too, or we don't bring really much to it. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis uh, today, chapters 26 through 50, and uh, that's a lot, but it is a, uh, it's a summary, it's an overview, there's some parts and pieces. I want to forewarn you, as I was looking through I've got 15 pages of notes. That don't mean anything. I can tell you five and could go on forever. But i got 15 pages of notes, and uh, when you get to about page 13, we're still in, like, chapter 36. And some of you are wired to be going through and kind of timing, all right, I get this, and you're going to look and be like, we're going to be here all night. We still, but 37 and through 50, there is a uh, some summary points that just fit nicely together. Uh, that, that you'll see when you get there. But the other chapters are things we need to pull out. And Pastor Zane did an a incredible job last week of moving us from the creation of the world to the creation of a covenant with Abraham and his offspring. In 
and uh, we pick up this week. So we'll start off in chapter 26, and I think you'll be able to keep pace with where we go. And we've already completed a verse-by-verse uh, exposition of these chapters, which we uh, love and enjoy, and it's so nurturing for us. Uh, so today we're going to be focusing on some more overarching themes that we find consistently coming up. And the big picture that I will focus on and come back to is every man is given an opportunity to act in rebellion or obedience. And you're going to see this over and over and over, rebellion or, or obedience. And in our lives, we will see that, that daily we have an opportunity to act in obedience to the Lord or in rebellion to the Lord. And the fruit that a man produces is directly connected to the soil his roots are dug into. So when we look at this, there's actually fruit that comes from the man of rebellion, and there's fruit that comes from the man of obedience. And the fruit that the man produces is directly connected to where he's allowed his roots to dig into and the soil that his roots are dug into. And Jesus teaches us that there's a good soil. And there's some not so good soil. There's some soil that you would never try to plant anything in because you know it wouldn't really work that well. But a soil that will be full of nutrients to produce good fruits. And in this teaching, the soil represents the heart. So essentially, our heart determines what fruit will come forth in our lives. An obedient heart produces obedient fruit or fruits of obedience. And a rebellious heart produces fruits of rebellion. In fact, as I was pondering this, it might be better to say that obedience produces a fruit. Obedience itself is a fruit. And that means that rebellion actually is fruitless or bearing no fruit at all. So we may say the fruit of rebellion, but there is no fruit in rebellion. And we, we see uh, an instance where Jesus sees a fig tree in the distance and he wants he goes to the fig tree because he wants figs and it's a fig tree and when he gets to the fig tree it has no fruit just leaves and because it has no fruit it's useless to him in his hunger and what he needs and he curses the the fig tree he says may no one ever eat fruit from you again we are expected to bear fruit And I'd hate to see Jesus coming to us from a distance expecting fruit and seeing only leaves. Looking like something that's obedience, but no fruit of obedience. So as we go through the chapters today, we're going to highlight some of the examples of obedience and rebellion. And Genesis 26 begins with a famine and how appropriate that is. It's nothing like a good famine to teach us about rebellion and obedience. And I don't even know if you guys have experienced a famine before, if you can relate to that. Uh, Maybe the closest thing we can uh, relate to is uh, what happens with our oil. I remember oil being $4 a gallon. Does anybody remember that? Uh, That was not fun. It changes how everything works. You don't travel as much. Someone asks you if you can go pick them up. You're like, I don't know, maybe, probably. Got to get some gas money. I mean, I hate to do it to you, but uh, that's four dollars to come pick you up. Jesus teaches us that in this life there will be trouble. Amen. Y'all, like, I don't want to amen that. In this life there will be troubles. Have you experienced troubles? Were you surprised? I've been surprised. I've had the expectation that uh, life could be trouble-free. If I'm being honest. I think many of us hope that we won't have any troubles. Some of us uh, try to do things just precisely the right way to avoid trouble. And when trouble comes, we, we get frustrated. We, we start looking in, trying to figure out why this has happened. But Jesus teaches us in this life there will be trouble. In this life there will be famines. But Jesus is greater than the famine, and he's greater than the struggles. And the bread Jesus provides sustains more than just the body it sustains the soul this body will grow it will fail the body you have will fail you some of you like i know it's already failing me it will grow frail and it will return to dust we don't like to dwell on that because it's just not exciting but that's 
that was what will happen to you. So all the meals you eat in your entire life, all the food that you're consuming, all the stuff that's just good, even if you're just trying to stay healthy, you can eat the healthiest morsels of food your entire life and do everything just right. That body will fail and it will turn back to dust. But the bread of life sustains the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness we just sang about that and as we were singing that my nerdy science self was thinking isn't it amazing that blood something that you know stains and that's the stains you can't hardly get out right the blood that stains cleanses us from all unrighteousness makes us white as snow and it kind of makes sense because the blood of Christ, once it gets on you, you can't get it out of you. But it doesn't stain you with a blemish. It stains you with righteousness. Isn't that awesome? So the bread of life, Jesus, is the food that gives us eternal life. And we have no other path to God but to consume Jesus. He talked about that, I believe, in uh, John chapter 6, around verse 66. Uh, we have to consume Jesus. And it makes me think of a little kid sitting at the dinner table with their green beans, and they're supposed to eat their green beans or their vegetables, and they've eaten everything that tastes good, but they don't want to eat the green beans. Do I have any non-green bean eaters in here? Just curious. I've got one. Anybody else? i got two. Anybody in the balcony? Uh, anybody have a vegetable that they just will not eat? Well, that didn't take long. It started coming out real quick. So I think of the little kids sitting at the dinner, dinner table, and uh, they're nibbling at the little bites and acting like they're eating them, but they're not really eating them. And then uh, a real responsible parent, the old school parent, will say something along the lines of, you're not leaving this dinner table to eat all them green beans. I don't care if you throw up. If you throw up, you're going to eat your thrown up green beans. <laughs> So don't throw up. By the way, don't be that. That was me. That's not good. That's a little bit too much. I forced my, my precious daughter to eat something one time. She didn't want to eat, and she threw up. And then my wife scolded me. See what you did? I didn't throw up. I'd have held it down. She's toughing up. We have to see Jesus as the choicest of meals and savor every bite of their relationship and when we think about consuming him the bread of life we get to enjoy if we let ourselves the flavor the texture the smell the feeling of the food filling our stomach don't you like that feeling like when you eat a good meal it's not just the taste but it's the texture of the food it's the way that you gently push up that smell up the back of your mouth and you smell it. Some of you are like, we, why are you talking about lunch again? But even when you swallow, the texture of the food that you swallow can be pleasant or unpleasant. But when it's in your stomach and you know that you're satisfied, man, that feels good. Because the hunger pains are comforted. And Jesus comforts the pain when we consume him but we got to consume him like the choicest food, not like the nasty green bean or the okra or the Brussels sprouts or all that other stuff. So we got to want him. But if we're being Judgment Day honest, some of us approach our relationship with Jesus like it's something that we have to eat. We approach our time with him like it's something that we have to do. And it becomes like he's that nasty vegetable on the plate that we're forcing ourselves to eat when that is not what he is. So in chapter 26, we see a famine and a promise. So verse 1 of 26, I'm going to read verse 1 through 5. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Isaac responds to the famine by going to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. But the Lord appears to him in the famine and said, Do not go to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land. And if you are obedient in these things I'm telling you to do, I will be with you. I will bless you. I will give you all of these lands. I will establish the oath I swore to Abraham. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. I will give your offspring all these lands. I will bless all the nations of the earth through your offspring. Because, get this, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and kept my commandments and my statutes and my laws. Right there we see a promise to Isaac that's connected to the obedience of Abraham. We're called to sojourn. This world is not our home. And when we start calling this world our home, we long to be here and apart from the Lord. And when we get our eyes on home, we long to be with our Lord and apart from this world. And that's a good spiritual check when you start desiring to be here more than there you need to look and see where you are in your relationship because God has called us to sojourn this is not our home this is not we don't when we make the world our home we start becoming like the world this is why the Lord has given these instructions to Isaac he's got something special for him a purpose for him it is not to be like those of the lands that he's in when we sojourn it sets something else up too God becomes our guide, our strength, our provider, our everything. That's what he wants in the relationship. He wants to be our sustainer, our provider, our everything. He doesn't want to be a small part of our life. He wants to be all of our life. And Isaac is called to be obedient in dwelling and sojourning in the land in which God shall tell him. Notice it's the land I shall tell you. He doesn't even get a preview. There's not an itinerary for all my people that like the itineraries. I know you. You don't, you don't get an itinerary. He's going to tell you and you're going to go. That's how obedience works. You don't get up in the morning and review the entire day with your child. You tell him in the moment, do this, do that, don't do this. That, and we respond or should and look at verses 4 through 5. It says, And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That's, what, that's why we're here today. We're a part of this promise. The, what puts us here together is faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and what he did on the cross to conquer sin and death and what he did in resurrecting. We have a promise in resurrecting because he's resurrected. And he resurrects everything, including us, if we put our faith in what he did for us. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Obedience is intertwined with faith. Obedience is intertwined with faith. We are obedient when we trust. We're obedient when we trust. And rebellion is nothing more than showing a lack of trust, a lack of confidence. Children rebel against their parents because they do not trust that what the parents have taught them and what they've taught them about the world around them is right. When do we start seeing rebellion in children? Some may have like, uh, they, they were born. But... When are those years when the rebellion is articulated into words in such a way that you just, like, I can't, I can't deal with this child? The teenage years. Lord have mercy on teenagers. They are so smart in their mind that they are starting to contemplate everything you've told them. 
Listen, when they're cute little kids, I love elementary school. I'm loving being at the elementary school. They're so pure and innocent. You tell them something and they just obey because you're in charge. They get older and they'll be like, why? Dad, I don't think you know what you're talking about. In school, we were talking about, listen, we're not at school. We're in my home. And I said, do this. I know, but I don't think that's the right way. Rebellion is a natural part of someone not trusting what they've been told, not trusting the source that they've been told. There are children who obey their parents, and when they obey their parents, um, they do that because they trust what their parents have taught them about the world and the world being right. And parents, I will tell you, there's a very important responsibility that our testimony to the world is extremely important, but we don't get to put our guard down in the house because it's the house. I know sometimes we get in the house and we don't dress as nice. We put on them comfy clothes that we don't actually wear out in town. Anybody have the comfy clothes they wear around the house? I've got a drawer full of coaching shorts I've collected through the years. That waist, you could stretch out to 50, 60 inches. It don't matter how much I ate, they're going to fit just right. I do not go out to Walmart looking like that. Well, I actually did yesterday. I did. That's my wife's fault, though. I will not. Okay, it was my fault. I was too lazy. You get older, you just quit caring what you look like out in public. That's sad, but it's enjoyable. (laughs) Obedience requires trust, and this is what we're going to see over and over. In Genesis uh, chapter 26, verse 7, we see, When the men of the place asked him about his wife, him being Isaac, he said, She is my sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. She is my sister. Y'all remember when we learned about this? God said, I will be with you. I will bless you. I will establish you. But Isaac didn't trust He rebelled. You're like, yeah, it's just one time. It's true. He rebelled in this moment. Isaac was worried that the men would kill him because his wife was attractive. That's a good-looking wife. No one's ever tried to kill me, but I'm going to tell you, they should have. I should be walking around in fear because my wife's attractive. But I put my trust in the Lord. Isaac takes things into his own hands because he was thinking. Look at the words that are in that scripture. He feared because he was thinking and he was predicting what would happen. That's what happens when we start getting rebellious and not being obedient. We start thinking. We start predicting. So he takes things into his own hands. In obedience, there's nothing to fear. In obedience, there's nothing to think about. In obedience, there's nothing to predict or worry about. And Isaac displays for us what it looks like to be obedient, but not in all things. And we can learn from that because often we're the same way. Oh, I trust the Lord. The Lord's got me. And then that one thing comes up and we are fearful and we think about it and we start making predictions and dwelling on the worst case scenario and we start trying to solve it ourselves instead of completely obeying and trusting in the Lord. Just because we set our hearts on worry does not justify what we're worrying about. I know lots of people in my life that are, bless them, they worry. Sometimes they wear me out, they worry so much. If you're worrying about stuff, that's a sign of rebellion because you're not trusting the Lord. You either trust Him or you don't trust Him. You can't proclaim that you trust Him and walk in faith and walk around worrying all the time. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6.34 that we should not be anxious about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worries of His own. The verse actually says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. That's kind of cool. Tomorrow's already worrying about itself, and you don't have to be involved. If tomorrow starts saying, hey, buddy, like tomorrow, you worry about your own worries. I'm in today. 
today is full of it today's got enough on it it says each day has enough trouble of its own so this is a great lesson i learned in the last couple of years is that my faith needs to be large enough for a day not for a year not for two because i'm not promised more than a day i know you've already made plans for tomorrow bless your hearts but you may have forgot to say what james teaches us lord willing i heard a lot of elder people in my life that i can tell read the bible because they said all kinds of wise things that i completely missed they would say things like well the lord willing we'll have church tomorrow i was like why wouldn't you have church because they understand that tomorrow is tomorrow today is what we have so today is what we live in it makes walking in obedience a lot easier it makes trusting in the lord a lot easier it makes your faith a lot more secure because you're not putting your mind and attention to things that you have no control over amen verse 17 isaac starts digging wells of his father and isaac gives the names of the wells the names that his father gave them and it's important we can pull from this it's important that we follow the example set by our parents when they give us good examples that we honor our mother and our father and when isaac starts digging up wells of water people begin to fight over the water because water is kind of a handy thing to have people people need it when we are obedient and following the ways of our father if his ways are aligned with the lord and when we're obedient and following the ways of our heavenly father when we start referring to things the way that our father in heaven refers to them people are going to want to fight over these things do not let that catch you off guard matter of fact one person that will fight over that will be your enemy the devil he doesn't want you being obedient how many times have you tried to do the right thing in your life and it's like immediately people just are there trying to convince you not to do that persuade you we remain obedient so isaac just keeps moving on and digging up the next well he doesn't stay and, and fight over it. he's like have the water i'm gonna move on i'm a, I, there's other wells i need to dig back up genesis uh, chapter 26 verse 24 through 25 notice we're still in chapter 26 do not have a panic attack we're going to get there i promise don't be like it's 26 <laughs> and the lord appeared to him the same night and said i am the god of abraham your father fear not for i am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant abraham's sake so he built an altar there and called upon the name of the lord and pitched his tent there and there isaac's servants dug a well i think this is a, a key part in isaac's life fear not i am with you i will bless you i will multiply your offspring for my servant abraham's sake it's the same as what we heard in the previous scripture it's the same clear consistent message from the lord don't fear i'm gonna bless you don't fear i'm with you don't fear i've got big things planned and it involves you and your offspring and their offspring matter of fact it's going to impact the whole world and notice that the obedience of abraham is having a tremendous impact on his son and on his son's yet to be offspring for abraham's sake we can pull from this don't be fooled into thinking that what you do with your life is your business i hear that so much it's my life it's my business i'm gonna do me i'm gonna do what i want you have no say so that's not accurate there's not one person's life that does not impact other lives even the freedoms we enjoy in this country are connected to us doing right things and being responsible we don't have complete freedom to do whatever we want to do you don't have the freedom to scream out fire right now and cause a panic that's not protected under our constitution your rebellion will impact generations upon generations that you will never meet in this life oh if we would understand that 
your lackluster following of Christ, your lukewarm approach to faith will have an impact on generations upon generations. And your obedience to the Lord and His statutes and what He has taught us to do will bless generations upon generations. We live in obedience and establish a legacy of obedience. What is Isaac's response when the Lord appears to him? He worships the Lord. He builds an altar and calls upon the name of the Lord. There's a point in each of our lives where we respond to the goodness of God and we worship him for who he is to us. Not for who dad says he was, not for who mom says he was, not for who the pastor says he was, but for who he is to us. Have you gotten to that point in your life where you've known the Lord for yourself and you have chosen to worship him? You've made a choice to follow him. Just because dad and mom followed him doesn't mean that you're going to automatically just be following him. It's a choice we have to make. I have seen who God is, and I will be obedient to him and not myself. In verses 34 through 35 in the same chapter, chapter 26, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Beri, and the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemuth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. It matters who you marry. Amen? Tell me all like, I'm not saying amen. I'm sitting right next to somebody. They'll pinch me or elbow the fire out of me. It matters who you marry. I know the world tells you that if you love them, that's all that matters. It's not. It's not. You can love all kinds of stuff that's no good for you. I love pizza with pepperoni and jalapeno peppers. But I promise you, if I eat that at 9 o'clock at night, it's going to be trouble. It gets worse the older I get. Maybe when I was 18, I could do that and sleep like a baby. Not no more. No, sir. It matters who you marry. Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal? What, or what does a believer have in common with unbeliever? This is bigger than just who you marry, who you keep company with, who you hang out with. If you don't come to church and you don't corporately worship and you don't have fellowship with the body of Christ, but you do hang out with people who are absolutely lost and hate God, that don't work out. You can love on lost people. You can minister to lost people. But you can't walk step in step with lost people. It won't work. And when you get married, if you choose someone, the Bible tells us that when you start a family, you depart from your mother and your father and you become one flesh. That one flesh has to be in agreement. If you are moving two different directions and two different speeds and you've yoked yourself together, you're going to have problems. I know most of you aren't farmers. I'm not either, but... I know if you take two beasts and you put a yoke around them, if one's really big and strong and one of them's sad and confused and they're trying to plow a field, that ain't going to work. If you got one that's obedient and one that's rebellious, that is not going to work. One's going to be trying to tow the line. One's going to be trying to run off here. What's going to happen to their necks? It's going to be a pain in the neck. It will be, and that's exactly what a marriage looks like when you're not yoked evenly. That's not something that you fix on the back side. That's something you've got to be on the same page on the front side. You're going to strive and strain all the days of your life. 
Verse 35 says that Esau made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Of course he did. You see what the scripture said about the woman he married? He married a woman named after math. It's in there. I saw it. Base math. He was told the type of women to stay away from and the type of women to marry. But Esau did what he wanted to do, what he thought was best. He completely ignored the teaching of his fathers. And there's a reason that he was taught that. And Esau shows us what rebellion looks like. I, Isaac and Rebekah are clear about who he should marry and who he should not. And he deliberately goes against his parents. Listen, it doesn't matter how cute that boy is or how pretty that girl is. The beauty of the face will go away with time. You know that's true because they got all kinds of magic creams they sell to make wrinkles go away and to make, make you, you know, this part of your chin, it will droop down eventually. It just will. Your skin's going to lose its last. You just, I would embrace it and just enjoy that moment, right? But it's going to happen. So if you are smitten by the looks of a person and that's the depth of your relationship, I can promise you that's going to go away. It just is. Hair's going to fall out. Hair's going to turn gray. Hair's going to start growing out of places that ain't normally there, like your nose and your ears. And if that's the depth of your relationship, you're going to be less in love as the years go on if it's just based on looks. Looks is not strong enough. Amen? What you need to look at is the heart because the beauty of the heart will actually increase over time what God looks at you need to find someone who will obey the Lord and his commandments because if that's the direction you're trying to walk that's who you're yoking your per yourself with that'll work rebellion robs you of opportunity and rebellion robs you of honor and rebellion is nothing more than responding to the desire of sin and forsaking God in chapter 27 Isaac blesses Jacob instead of Esau Isaac tells Esau to go out and kill some game and prepare it for him so he can bless Esau before he dies. Mom overhears this. By the way, you know moms hear everything. If you don't know that, just I don't know how they do it, but they do. Moms know. You don't even have to actually say it. You can think it, and they know what you're thinking. It's, it's impressive. Verses 6 through 14, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. And his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. We call Jacob the trickster. But in reality, Jacob is completely obedient to his mother. His mother told him twice, obey my voice. What are you supposed to do when your mama says, obey your voice? You obey. He even questioned the first time. He said, well, mom, what about, and she said, let the curse be on me. Obey my voice. And we may be thinking that Rebecca was not doing the right thing, but if we look back to chapter 25, in 25, Rebecca goes before the Lord. Chapter 25, verses 22 through 23. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The children inside of her, they're at each other. They're not even born yet, they're at each other. You know it's going to be a rough household. You've got two boys in there, and they're just 
at each other and they're not even born yet so she goes to the lord and she acquires and the lord said to her two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided the one shall be stronger than the other the older shall serve the younger the lord told her that jacob was going to be in charge she knew that she didn't think that she didn't wish that she didn't want to hope that that's what she got from the lord so why is rebecca making sure that jacob gets the blessing because she knows that's the plan she heard that straight from the lord later in verse 32 we see that esau sold his birthright for food that's sad i mean i've been hungry before but you sell your whole birthright because you're hungry you're not going to die from pass out from hunger you, you'll come together eventually get something to eat isaac ignored the words of god to rebecca he ignored the selling of the birthright he ignored Esau's disobedience in the marriages. And we see Isaac still favoring Esau over Jacob, despite the rebellion of Esau. So we may choose to ignore rebellion, maybe even put up with rebellion, but God does not. So unknowingly, Isaac blesses Jacob, even though his heart was set on blessing Esau. Esau finds out that Jacob got the blessing, and he's devastated he pleads for a blessing in verse 34 of chapter 27 it says that esau cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry every time i see stuff like that it reminds me an exceedingly not just that he cried out exceedingly like great emphasis he's heartbroken and he says to his father bless me even also my father and isaac says i've made him lord over you what can i do for you it's done and Esau hated his brother, and he sets his heart on killing him. Moms know everything, and Rebekah hears that Esau is intent on killing Jacob. So in verse 43, she says, Obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, and Haran, and stay with him for a while. In chapter 28, Isaac calls Jacob and blesses him and directs him. At the beginning of chapter 28, Isaac tells his son, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of people, of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Isaac instructs him to not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and he instructs him to go to laban and to marry one of his daughters esau sees that jacob is obedient to his parents wishes for marriage so esau decides the canaanite women are a problem and they don't please my father so i'm going to marry uh, mahalath the daughter of ishmael abraham's son obedience at its core is about doing what someone else has deemed right esau is trying to do what he wants to do and give the perception of obedience obedience to self is rebellion to god we're taught in matthew chapter 6 but seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you but sometimes we like to seek all these things and hope that we get the righteousness and the kingdom of God also. In this instance, we see Jacob doing it right, being obedient. We see Esau doing what he wants to do, but trying to give the image of some half-hearted obedience. We find in uh, chapter 28 that Jacob has a, a dream. In a dream, there's a ladder and on the ladder, there's angels of God ascending and descending. He has an encounter with God. And again, we see that there's a point where each person encounters God. And at that point, obedience or rebellion will always be the response. There is no in-between. Jacob experiences God. God says, I am the Lord 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. The question is, will I be the God of Jacob? Jacob, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. In reverent fear and awe, Jacob proclaims, How awesome is this place! This is the house of God. As we continue on, we see that Jacob meets Rachel at a well in a field. He's being obedient to his parents. He's going to where he's supposed to go, and he hears that Rachel's coming. And uh, they say, yeah, she's coming. She's bringing the flock. He's waiting at the well. This, this is in chapter 29. When he sees her, he becomes manly man, removes a large stone away, and waters the flock. And verse 29, 11 says, Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. Talk about first impression. Are you Rachel? You just kiss her and fall on her and start weeping? Like, okay, lover boy. This boy was smitten. Matter of fact, we know this from going through it, how smitten he was. In verse 18 it says, Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter. Now listen, we know that Laban tricks Jacob. Jacob agrees to work for seven years specifically for Rachel, and then on the night that he's supposed to have Rachel, Laban sneaks Leah in there, and then he wakes up the next morning, and it's the wrong daughter. And he's like, that's messed up. He goes, oh, well, it's our custom that you marry the oldest first, and then you can also have the youngest. That seems like a seven years ago conversation, right? And, but how about this? Do you think Jacob kind of knew that the right thing to do would be to marry the oldest as well as the youngest? He was set. He had his heart set on Rachel. That's what he wanted. He didn't care about how anybody else was affected. We don't really lean into that part. We're just an evil Laban. But he had a part in that as well. But when he's told that he's got to work another seven years, he agrees. And he honors the promise, and he does that. In chapter 29, the Lord sees that Leah was hated, and he opens up her womb. And from her womb, the one that's hated, comes the line of Judah. God brings, get this, this is so awesome, God brings love to the world through the womb of the unloved. Isn't that just like God? Oh, you despise her, you hate her? How about this? I will bring the most the i will bring actual love into the world through the offspring of this womb from the womb of the unloved comes the one that would love the world so much that he would give his life and when rachel saw that that she bore jacob no children she envied her sister and we get a lot of girl drama going on between these wives about who is producing offspring and who is not producing offspring, and they're seeking the favor of Jacob using their womb, which is a little odd, but that's what's going on. My womb's better than your womb. No, it's not. My womb can be good. No, apparently not, because, I, look, I'm producing children, you're not. And we laugh at that, and that's silly, but uh, we're not too far from that today in trying to seek the favor of people, seeking the attraction of men, seeking the, uh, the, just think about how we operate and how we're trying to gain people's affection, fighting over, knowing that we have a God who loves us just the way we are. Chapter 30 says, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she names her son Joseph. Jacob prospers, and he blesses the Lord. We see that in chapter 31. Uh, Jacob hears that the sons of Laban are saying, bad things about him and making accusation he's like it's time to go and the lord reinforces that the lord tells him in chapter 31 he said to jacob return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred and i will be with you the lord said and jacob did another example of obedience uh his wives said whatever god has said to you do boy isn't that a comfort when your wife's right there on board with like hey if the lord said it you got to do it Laban chases after them, but in the end, um, Laban goes away. He kisses his grandchildren and his daughters, and he returns home. 
So Laban's no longer a threat, but Jacob's returning home. And guess who's waiting for him at home? Esau, his brother that wants to murder him. So he's got to go through, am I going to get murdered? What's going to go up with my brother? What's going to happen? In chapter 32, Jacob wrestles. Chapter uh, 32, verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. There's no explanation given, no buildup. It's just... Jacob's left alone, and then he wrestled all night long. It's like, whoa, whoa where'd that come from? Was it, did it have altercations? Somebody said something to him? Were they fighting over a piece of fried chicken? Like, what's, something had to happen. Um, there's no explanation. Just one of those things where it's good to get into exposition, but the encounter that he had with the Lord that night changed him forever. And Jacob and Esau finally encounter each other. And we see that Esau runs to Jacob and embraces him, and they cry. And we see that finally, old rebellious Esau has got some things straight in his life, and he doesn't have that bitterness gripping his life, and he's happy for his brother and proud of his brother and loves his brother. Chapter 34, Leah's daughter, uh, Dinah, is defiled, and this causes uh, Simeon and Levi to trick them into circumcision and take it upon themselves to kill everything to kill all the men and plunder the city. And that's a response of Jacob seemingly inaction. So even our inaction can be a lack of obedience. Sometimes when wrong things are done, we're supposed to correct those and not uh, just turn a blind eye to it. And we see Jacob had a, a bad habit of just turning a blind eye to things, letting things go, and not really making them right. In chapter 35, God changes the relationship with Jacob. And it's it's never the same again he says your name is jacob no longer shall your name be called jacob but israel shall be your name and he brings forth the nation of israel from jacob and in chapter 37 we get to the narrative of genesis being centered around a character named joseph and what we see in joseph is something we've yet to completely see in abraham and isaac and in Jacob. And what we see in uh, Joseph is really unique and inspiring. We see obedience, unwavering, steadfast, determined obedience. Joseph does not waver no matter what the circumstances. And in this Joseph, we also see glimpses of Jesus. Joseph is a shepherd, Jesus is the great shepherd. Joseph's father loved him dearly, God loved his son so much. Joseph was hated by his brother, so was Jesus. Joseph is sent by his father to his brothers. Jesus was sent by his father to us. Harm is plotted against both of them. Robes are taken from both of them. They're both taken to Egypt. They're both tempted. They're both falsely accused. They're both bound in chains, both placed with two other prisoners. One is saved and one is lost, both exalted after suffering both 30 years old roughly at the time of public recognition they both weep and know how to weep for things both forgave those who wronged them both saved their nation and both men had evil that was meant against them but god turned to good joseph believed his dreams and accepted his role even if he did not understand how it would come about joseph loved his brothers even though they despised him Joseph cried out from the pit, but he trusted God in the circumstance. He walked in chains across the desert to Egypt as a slave, but he remained faithful to God and obedient to his commandments. Joseph worshiped God, not what God did for him. In everything entrusted to Joseph, he fully put himself into it. The Lord was with Joseph at Potiphar's house, Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord had caused him and all that he did to succeed. And Joseph found favor in the sight of him. Joseph is in prison and he's still faithful to God. Joseph trusts God to interpret dreams. Joseph, whose own dreams seem to not make sense or to be remotely likely to be accurate, still trust God to be faithful in what he reveals in dreams. 
Isn't that incredible? Joseph knows the dreams that God had given him as a young boy, and they don't remotely seem to be being filled in his life, but he still trusts God unwavering. Joseph interprets the dreams of Pharaoh, and we know that when he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh, Pharaoh takes him and brings him to a great place, puts him second in command over all Egypt. And we return to a famine. It takes another famine to bring reconciliation with Joseph and his brothers. And Joseph wisely and patiently deals with his brothers in such a way that reconciliation can come about. And he tells his brothers, God sent me to preserve your life. You did not send me here. It was God. Man, isn't that powerful? You thought you were doing, you didn't do nothing. God sent me here, but he did it to preserve your life. Joseph was not obedient to his father. He was obedient to the Lord. We get to the very end of getting chapter 50, and the brothers are nervous because when they see that their dad is dead, they're worried that now that dad's dead, maybe Joseph is finally going to really show his true colors and exact his revenge. But Joseph tells them, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. There's a lot of things we can pull from Genesis about obedience and rebellion. No matter what circumstance or situation, we have the opportunity daily to be obedient to the Lord our God, to his commandments, to his covenants, or to rebel against his ways. It makes me think of a song from way back when, when I was a little kid. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Such simple words, trust and obey, for there's no other way there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And I think we've covered pretty accurately today what it looks like to be obedient. Obedient means you're not questioning God. You're not second-guessing God. God don't even have to explain. When Joseph was in that pit, he didn't need an explanation. He trusted God. When Joseph was walking through the desert in chains, he didn't need an explanation. He trusted God. When he is in Potiphar's house as a slave, he trusted God. In the prison, he trusted God, no matter what circumstance. Man, what a, what a person to, to follow after in obedience. Was Joseph perfect? He was not, but his heart was set in obedience to the Lord. He loved his Lord, and he did not waver. I hope to be like Joseph, but I've got to confess to you, I'm a lot more like them other guys. I've been very inconsistent. But that was yesterday. That was in the past. That's not today. And remember, we live in faith day by day. So today, are you obedient? Today, are you rebellious? Today, is your heart set on the Lord? Don't worry about tomorrow, because when you wake up tomorrow, you give thanks that tomorrow actually came, and that you have breath in your lungs, and you commit yourself to be obedient to the Lord and His ways. You can't be obedient to the Lord unless you know what His commandments are. Where do you find his commandments? In his word. His word can't be a light to your path unless you actually know his word. So I want to encourage you, make time to be with the Lord. Let him speak to you and to teach you and to guide you so that you can be obedient. Amen? We're going to have a time of reflection, and we don't often do this, but today during time of reflection, uh, we're, we're going to open up the front. If you feel so led, if you need to come forward, if you need to pray, if you got stuff on your heart and you just feel like you need to come before the Lord, come before the Lord. It's open. If you need to speak one of the pastors, we'll make ourselves available to you. If you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ, you don't have to do it through a ceremony or a certain place, but some of you may need to go, I need to get right right now. We want to give you the opportunity for that to take place if you need it. Amen? Father, we come before you. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Oh, how lost we'd be without it. 
And Lord, even though we have your word, sometimes we don't even bother to, to look at it, to dwell at it, on it, to study it, to ponder it, to hide it away in our hearts, Lord God. And it causes us to be disobedient in complete ignorance. Lord, forgive us for falling short. Father, I thank you that we have a path to be reconciled to you through your son, Jesus Christ. There is no other way to get to you than through Jesus Christ. And Father, for those of us who have proclaimed to be followers of Christ, that have proclaimed to be in love with your son and choose to follow him all the days of our lives, Lord God, if we found ourselves in rebellion and in lackluster obedience in that, Lord, we, we confess to you right now. Lord, and we set our hearts upon right now in this moment being obedient to you, following you, serving you, being obedient to your commandments and what Jesus taught us to do and how to live. Lord, obedient to seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and trusting that everything else will fall in place just as you have determined it for our lives. Lord, teach us to be content with the life you've given us. Lord, whether we're in a pit of despair, whether we're walking through the desert, whether we're not in the place we thought we'd be, it doesn't matter because we're in the one we need to be in, and that is your son, Jesus Christ. Father, in a moment, we're going to just reflect on what you've taught us out of your word today. Lord, we're going to set our hearts on you. Lord, we're going to open up the altar for anyone that needs to come forward. Lord, I pray that they would boldly come before the mercy seat. Confess, repent, make things right, commit, pray for people they're concerned about, give their hearts to Jesus Christ, whatever needs to happen, Lord. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
invited to join us at First Baptist Church in St. Mary's. Rick Corum will be in dialogue there. I was saying concert. I don't think he's going to sing. Uh, but uh, our praise team will be doing the music, so please come down 630 First Baptist Church on Weed Street in St. Mary's. We'd love to see you there at 630. Also, uh, this morning we started a new members class. Pastor Mark was teaching that class. I think there was, I don't know, eight families or so represented. So it's, uh, this was the first morning. There will be four of them. So if you missed out this morning and you want to unite with us in membership, it's not too late. Just get with Pastor Mark and he'll tell you exactly what you need to do. In the foyer, there are some resources available for the persecuted church to show you exactly how you can pray for them. And then next Sunday morning, we'll dedicate our whole morning service to praying for the persecuted church. It's the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. And then next Sunday night, as Pastor Zane mentioned this morning, we are going to have First Baptist Church will be joined with us here as we have a prayer service on Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. We will have child care, and if you know your little one is going to be here, if you could make contact with Cindy, uh, just holler at Cindy Redding, and she'll make sure that we have good child care for all our children that need to be cared for. On December, this is for your planning purposes. I'm a planner, so I want you to plan too on December the 5th. Now you're thinking, December is so far away. Next Sunday is November 1st of 2020. I know we lost like seven months, but uh, still the calendar moves on. December 5th and December 12th. We'll be ringing the bell for the Salvation Army, I am assuming, and it is correct. It'll be at Walmart on the grocery side. So if you want to volunteer for that, you're going to do something to volunteer and put your name down and then sign as a commitment that you will be there. There'll be a sign-up sheet out in the foyer for that. I had to, It was in small print. So I think that is all the happenings that are happening. There's a macrame class on November 7th. Carrie, do you know about that? You're teaching that, aren't you? No, you've got, uh, you called in a ringer for that one, didn't you? Sheila Moore will be in the house, and she'll be teaching you how to macrame. The queen she is, the queen of crafts. I mean, give her some trash. She'll make necklace and earrings out of it. She is amazing with this stuff. So she's going to be teaching a macrame class here at the church at 10 a.m., 0100, uh, Saturday the 7th. Cost is $7. See Carrie, my lovely, very beautiful wife, uh, over there. I did not have to work for her seven years. Zach, you owe me six years for Amelia. Just remind you about that. All right, I think that's it. Let's, oh, Ma- where, Mark, uh, Marky Mark. Uh, We're going to do something a little bit different. Yes, we are. Oh, we will. Uh, Mark is going to see and uh, going back on deployment, he's back on one of our nation's strategic platforms. And the way that the Navy works now, I think you have to quarantine for like six months before you actually go to sea. So this is Mark's last Sunday for a while. So uh, he may rebel, but he won't. Won't because obedience is operating by faith trusting that the one who is telling you what to do right that's what pastor mark said so carry your happy little self up here and we're going to ask if you want to come up here let's just pray for him that he has a wonderful deployment that he has lots of opportunities to share the gospel of christ and he doesn't get his fingers smashed in machines he types that's why i mean he's like basically what he does he's we hope he doesn't have to do his job he's a missile tech So he is in, uh, yeah, Gabby, we'll need you because uh, Rory is at whatever age that rebellion comes out. (laughs) And she is rebellious. Zane, you got a microphone? I do not. You got it. Okay, then. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we are so glad, so grateful for the message that we heard this morning. Father, as we contemplate all of what Pastor Mark shared with us, we are reminded of the responsibility of fatherhood and of husbandhood. And Lord, I pray that you would be with Mark as he goes to sea providing for the defense of our great nation. 
Lord, I pray that you'd be him with the crew, give him opportunities to share the incredible gospel of Christ. Help him to be faithful in the calling that you have given him. Lord, I pray as Gabby keeps the home fires burning and, and takes all the responsibilities of being that uh, Navy wife, being responsible at home for keeping the home and taking care of Rory, Lord, I pray that you'd be with her. Help them to both know they are well loved by their church family, and Father, they are loved with a perfect love by our Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray blessings upon Mark. I pray blessings upon his family. And Lord, as we leave this place, Father, I pray blessings on our congregation as we seek to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Father, we ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You're dismissed. We'll see you all tonight downtown.